So a decade ago, a former colleague of mine at a newspaper I was working at um, wrote a piece about death. New research then in 2011 had discovered that human beings have the potential to live well beyond 100 and that this potential was sort of embedded in our uh, genetic makeup. He'd written a response uh, to that news story saying, well, who wants to live forever, not me? I remember reading his article and feeling baffled by him. He was essentially arguing in favor of finite existence over what he classed as the groundhog day of perpetual life. And it, he argued that it was not living forever and the knowledge of not for, living forever that gives um, our lives its, its value. Uh, I was astonished by the idea that somebody might not want to live on and on, life's full of joys, pleasures, connections, loves. Why wouldn't you want to experience that indefinitely, in, in, infinitely? Um, don't we all want to live forever? Don't we all want to stay young forever? Medical science is discovering ways to triumph over once fatal diseases. 60s, apparently the new 40. There's fitness regimes, dermophilas, Botox to fend off the signs of aging and the human genome project that my colleague was writing about, uh, which promised to identify and eliminate uh, every negative tendency in our DNA. So isn't our triumph over nature uh, to keep on living only a matter of time? And of course it's desirable, isn't it? Uh, strangely or strange to myself, I've changed my mind since 2011. And I now feel that death is important to life. And I don't think I'm being morbid or flippant in saying that. We've just been through a pandemic uh, and experienced a, a staggering amount of loss and grief globally. Uh, I'm not suggesting that illness, suffering, grief are welcome things in themselves, or that we need to be Pollyanna-ish about, about uh, it all and or look for meanings, uh, but experience experiencing suffering or loss is not the same thing as living in a way that's mindful of the reality of death and our own deaths. Loss is very different. The loss of a loved one is the most devastating and tragic thing to hap happen to any of us. I lost my older sister five years ago suddenly when she was 45 years old and she's the subject of my memoir. Um, She'd been feeling ill for months. She'd been shuttling in and out of hospital for weeks before her death. And the doctors couldn't identify what was wrong with her. Um, she had a fatal brain hemorrhage and we were told to gather around her bed. But even then, the doctors couldn't name what, what had killed her. And only 24 hours later, they realized it had been tuberculosis, which is an ancient disease that could have been cured with antibiotics had, had it been diagnosed in time. So we were flabbergasted as a family. Uh, did, did people still die of TB in this day and age in London, in a state-of-the-art hospital? How was this possible? Um, well, it was, it was very possible, I found out when I spoke to my sister's doctors. TB wasn't a throwback to another era. It hadn't gone away. And in fact, it was making a comeback. So there I was thinking it was yesteryear's disease now extinct, certainly in the West, but I couldn't have been more wrong because TB rates in London the year before my sister died in 2015 uh, exceeded those rates in Rwanda, Eritrea and Iraq. Uh, and a third of London boroughs exceeded the World Health Organization's high incident threshold. And although those rates have come down in Britain since then, uh, we, we may just have pushed them out of our line of vision uh, because we have a, a, a new tuberculosis strategy, uh, which involves compulsory pre-entry screening for anyone wishing to come to, to the UK um, for longer than six months. But globally, TB remains the top infectious diseases killer with 10 million people infected, 1.5 million people dying of it in 2018. In 2019, which is a year before COVID swept across the world, uh, a panel of 80 experts described tuberculosis as a pandemic. In a report, uh, they wrote that tuberculosis, tuberculosis could be treated, 
prevented and cured. Yet this disease remains a, a relentless scourge, they said. So it's a pandemic now folded inside our more recent pandemic. But nonetheless, I was full of horror and bitterness after my sister died of this curable disease. And I felt she'd been cheated out of half a life. She ought to have lived until you know, 80, 90, the kind of lifespan we think we have a right to in the developed world. Uh, but slowly her loss has changed the way I look at death. Um, I found myself taking a lot of journeys as an investigation into her life and death. I went to Norway to look at a painting uh, that Edvard Munch had painted of his sister Sophie, who also died of TB in childhood, in fact. And I went to Tuscany to, to listen to a, a Puccini opera, La Boheme, about a beautiful doomed tubercular woman because I'd given my sister opera tickets when she was a teenager for that very opera. And I also went to Rome to visit the Sistine Chapel, which is where my sister had gone after her first very big bout of depression. And she'd come back from the Sistine Chapel, transformed for a while. And it seemed as if the art she'd seen there had cured her. So I went to see what she'd seen. Um, and when I stepped inside the chapel and, and looked, looked at its walls, I felt that so much of life in there was defined by its opposite. So ecstasy by agony, good by evil, the seen by the unseen, God by the devil. And these contrasts gave each other their meaning and shape. And then last September in the middle of lockdown, I read a column written by a young man called Elliot Dallin and he'd been diagnosed with terminal cancer. He was 31, he'd had, he had just weeks to live and he wrote this column because he wanted to pass on a few tips about living. Um, his tone in, in the column surprised me. He, he'd refused a drug trial because it, it had made him feel debilitated and he didn't want to just clock up the years, he said, so, so he was preparing to die. And he wrote, um, there will always be places and experiences missing from anyone's life. The world has too much beauty and adventure for one person to see. But I think my time has been pretty good. A life, if lived well, is long enough. And most surprisingly of all, he said that despite the diagnosis and the very low times, um, he, life since that diagnosis hadn't, hadn't just been bearable, it had actually been fantastic. And, and what he said reminded me of a text message that I got from my sister. She'd sent it from her hospital bed the month before she died. She was feeling a lot better. Her doctors thought that she'd beaten this mystery illness. And her text message said, I have not died and the world has become so colourful. And that conjured up a moment in which she must have seen the world all the more vividly being at such close quarters to death, a sort of intimation of mortality, if you like to rephrase uh, Wordsworth's poem on, on the intimations of immortality. I'm not saying that we need to have a close brush with death to appreciate life more fully, but I am saying we don't need to be afraid of the prospect of not living forever. <clears throat> the palliative care doctor, um, Catherine Mannix, wrote of the importance about talking about death in her book, With Death in Mind, uh, that it needn't be monstrous, that we should make plans for it, discuss it, live alongside it. Um, a few weeks after my sister died, I went out with a couple of very close friends who'd have both had um, much more death in their lives than I'd ever had. And we sat down for a pizza and they sat there listening to me as I raged about my sister's lack of diagnosis, about the unfairness of it all, about the unfairness of her dying at 45, just as she'd got herself back on track after years of depression. And I said, what's the point of it all? You know, if we have to die, what does it all boil down to? And one of them said uh, this, this is the point of it, sitting here in this restaurant, eating pizza, and there may be no grander scheme than the pizza and the friendship. And if, if that's really all we have, isn't it okay? 
uh, being with the people we love, eating pizza, drinking a cup of coffee in the sun. Um, the end is where we start from, wrote T.S. Eliot in Four Quartets. The end is where we start from. And like the other 31-year-old Eliot said last September, um, however, long we <clears throat> however long we have, if life is lived well, it is enough. So I don't think it's immortality that leads us to happiness, but being aware of just how mortal we are. So in other words, we don't need to live forever to be happy. In fact, the key is in the opposite, to remember that we don't. Thank you. <laughs>